This is a Shaoblin 22 milling machine. I bought this machine as the long-awaited replacement for the mini mill which I'm currently using. The machine was in a bad enough shape that I could afford it. But there is still a reasonable chance that the machine is in a good enough condition that I will be able to fix it. Although I'm looking forward to leave my comfort zone for this project and learn new stuff on the way, I'm far from a real machinist or mechanic and my knowledge and skills are very limited. So there is also a real chance that I will have to abort this mission at some point when it turns out that the machine is damaged to a level which is beyond what I can fix or accept. In order to minimize the risk of Putting a lot of time and energy into a machine, I'm eventually unable to fix my plan to approach this whole restoration was to only roughly clean the machine on the outside and after that spend the time for a thorough inspection. For example, what is the run out of the spindle or uh, how worn are the ways. Also, the machine is damaged. Uh, someone hit it with a forklift and uh, screwed up the electromechanical joystick to operate the feeds, including the mechanics behind it. These knobs are used to fix the horizontal milling overarm, but neither the overarm nor the cover for the front came with the machine. Also, the outside of the machine is in a very bad condition. It has certainly not been cleaned in a very long time. There is a solidified layer of oil with metal chips and shavings baked into it. Even with a pretty aggressive solvent-based cleaner and the roughest of my Scotch-Brite sponges, it was very hard to get that solidified layer of oil down. It almost felt like this polymerized surface coating on a cast iron pan. After trying to clean up the most accessible surfaces on the machine for at least an hour, I realized that only roughly cleaning up the machine on the outside before inspection would also take me several days. So at some point I simply abandoned my plan to cleaned the machine on the outside before inspection and uh, went ahead. I can cope with some green in my workshop for a limited amount of time, but that bright orange cable is just too much color for me. So it had to go. I'm reusing this cord from a former project. I'm also replacing the cable gland here. The original one didn't really work. I like these machine cables short and then rather move the outlet to the machine. Looks a lot more tidy in the workshop. Quickly checking the order of phases here. When reusing such cords from a former project, you never know. Before the machine is placed in its final position, I'm using a extension cord.
That sounds good to my ears. Now let's try fast. Let's compare that to the sound signature of my mini mill. Now that I have power and a turning spindle, I can go ahead and test the main spindle run out of the machine. I'm bringing the head into the horizontal milling position, simply because it's more convenient to measure in this position. I'm tightening the quill here so that uh, it doesn't have any impact on the measurement. The machine uses an ISO 30 taper. I'm first taking a measurement directly on the inside taper, which will be a combination of uh, surface roughness of the taper and uh, the run out of the spindle. That doesn't look too bad. Run out seems to be in the area of 20 microns. Next are measurements on various types of tool holders. All of them are used and of unknown origin or quality. I'm also switching to a 1 micron indicator, which was also made in Switzerland a long time ago. For most of the measurements I take, runout remains within these plus minus 10 microns, which is good enough for me to proceed. The machine has a central lubrication system, but there isn't any resistance in pulling the lever, so I guess the oil tank is empty. Before I move any of the axes, I want to make sure that they are properly lubricated. A fresh tank of whey oil is certainly the first step to get lubrication going again, but uh, electrical tape on the oil hose makes me suspicious that only filling up oil won't do the trick. I had to bring out the large canister of whey oil. The machine sucked up at least two liters of fresh oil. It took me quite some time to get it all in there. After about 10 iterations of filling up and pumping again, there was still no perceivable resistance when pulling the handle. I was already afraid that the internal tank had a leak and the oil was draining to the inside of the machine. But after about 10 minutes of filling and pumping, there was for the first time a perceivable pumping action going on. As I suspected, that hose was trash and uh, needed to be replaced. Of course, as soon as I removed the hose, the oil began to drip out the port. Luckily, I found a small set screw in my pneumatics drawer, which uh, perfectly sealed the opening. I have really no clue how such oil stuff works and uh, I have no clue how these couplings are called or how they are attached to the hose. 
but dead holes definitely looked beyond saving. But since I had no idea how these couplings are called and they would for sure come in one million different sizes and I would for sure not get the right ones. So I was willing to go through some trouble to get them out in the hope that I would find a way to attach them to a new hose. With the ringy end this wasn't too much of a problem. I was able to wind it out but with the round one there was really no way I could grab it to turn the blue anodized aluminium thing. So things got a bit rough. How the heck did they get that thing on there? Shit. I didn't quite manage to not grind into the coupling, but uh, I hoped it would still be fine. Mission accomplished. Got the two couplings out and only needed to clean them up before I could try to mount them into a new hose. This bolt like hollow oil coupling was a perfect example for the solidified oil layer which was all over the machine. I spent some time trying to clean it up with a wire brush and solvent based cleaner but despite all these efforts it didn't really quite clean up. So this was another confirmation for me that this stuff was really badly on there and very hard to get off. There were even metal chips still sticking onto the bolt. So the only stuff I was so far afraid to get out was brake cleaner because it just wouldn't scale to dip the whole machine in brake cleaner but apparently this was the only thing which really resolved this layer of grime. Now that's a clean bolt. The good thing about it is that the bolt looks pretty nice underneath that layer. I'm lucky that holds true for the whole machine. The only holes in the right diameter I was able to find is for pressurized air or gas. These industrial grade gas hoses are normally oil proof, at least on the outside. And a pressure limit of 20 bars should be fine for this application. I'm pretty happy that I was already able to remove these blue anodized aluminium fittings. They were real eyes saw on the machine. One color less. I was super curious what would happen next when I pulled that lever. Would it just leak all over or would maybe the hose burst? Or would it actually work? Nice. It actually worked. After making sure that there was plenty of oil dripping out on all of the axes, I wanted to clean up the ways and remove most of the dirt before I move any of the axes any further. So uh, brake cleaner it was. Although that stuff is uh, very aggressive, it Still took elbow grease to get that oil layer down. That brake cleaner is uh, pretty toxic and for sure causes all kinds of cancer. So yeah, really make sure to wear, um, you know, a respirator and gloves, of course. Uh, 
so you really wouldn't want to get that stuff on your naked skin. Now after removing most of the dirt from the ways of the vertical axis I was more comfortable with testing power feed for the first time. This machine has power feed in two axes, X and Z, which is uh, moving the table sideways and up and down. The machine uses uh, two motors for that, but unlike you would maybe think it's not one motor per axis but uh, one motor is dedicated for power feeding and the other one is dedicated for rapid. So both of these motors are driving the same shaft. One is permanently attached, the other clutched in using an electromagnetic clutch. And this single shaft is then either geared into the x-axis or the z-axis to either move the table sideways or up and down. And all of that is controlled using this single electromechanical joystick. And as you can see, there is absolutely zero motion in any direction. As always, if something's not working, first thing to do is remove any covers to see what's going on inside. This is the three-phase AC motor for Rapid. It's coupled with the shaft using a V-belt. I'm also removing the side cover of this uh, main control cabinet. Unless this potentiometer is communicating through a one-wire protocol with the machine, which I doubt something's wrong here. So I go ahead and also remove the front cover. This must be the most hardcore joystick the world has ever seen. It appears that every part of that joystick was machined out of solid steel. My first guess is that the axis selection works purely mechanical, while the direction of rotation is controlled using two micro switches and an additional micro switch is selecting between power feed and rapid. I'm super excited to get that thing apart and uh, find out how it works and uh, whether I can fix it. But I think the whole joystick repair will make for a nice episode 2 of the series. I promise that you don't have to wait as long for episode 2 as you had to wait for episode 1. Actually, I already have footage for at least five or six episodes. It's just that I didn't take the time for editing so far. Doing voiceovers in a foreign language is uh, not as recreational as working on the machine itself. So make sure to let me know whether you think that adds any value or whether I can also drop it. Anyway, thank you for watching. And see you next time.